so many people joining us can't keep up um okay so folks um just to welcome um hannah dalglish so hannah um, and dr hannah dalglish is a, an astrophysicist by training um she's a researcher and a science communicator uh, working at the intersection between science uh, astronomy and society her research includes understanding how astronomy impacts the lives of people around the world and Hannah has been involved in numerous projects related to dark sky tourism, uh, astronomy, education, science communication and light pollution. And she's currently working on a project with Armagh Council and in partnership with Armagh Observatory and Planetarium to develop a policy on light pollution. So for tonight's talk, we really look forward to hearing about her work in Namibia. Um, stories and uh, styles and stories and with that I will welcome you all and hand over to Hannah and um, thanks for joining us Hannah. Thank you very much for for having me. Um, ABBA is currently playing in the background so I hope you can't hear that. <laughs> um, let me get to the right screen. Okay hopefully that is showing the right screen. So yeah, um, it's really great to be able to talk again about Namibia, where I spent seven months uh, in the middle of the pandemic somehow. It took me a few months to get there. Um, so as I was finishing my PhD, I saw a, a postdoc being advertised where they were essentially looking for um, someone who had done astronomy and astrophysics and a lot of outreach and were interested in sustainable development. And I thought, wow, how can you do astronomy and sustainable development? Um, and kind of learned all the different ways that, that they go hand in hand. Um, and so, yeah, this is a bit about all the different things um, that I was working on in Namibia. Um, and hopefully you'll find it a little bit interesting. So. This is a map I'm sure many of you are familiar with, um, the map of the world at night time, kind of showing where all the light is being emitted. And so, yeah, mostly um, you see it in Europe and in the US and um, Japan, um, but Africa um, is very dark mostly. And so more than 83% of people are living under light polluted skies, which is quite a lot of people. So in case you don't know where Namibia it is, where Namibia is, it's kind of right here in the south, southern part of Africa, just north of South Africa. And as you can see here, it's it's pretty much mostly dark. The bright spot in the middle, that's the capital city, Vintuk. Um, and here on the west coast, you can see some towns, Swakopmund and Walvis Bay, um, and some few other smaller towns dotted around, but mostly it is very, very dark. And this means that it's absolutely fantastic for doing astronomy um, and things like astrotourism and, and so on. And also what's great is that it's actually the driest country in Africa, which means very little clouds. And so unlike here, even though you have dark skies, you might not see, you probably won't see the stars because it's cloudy, but in Namibia, you'll mostly be fine unless it's the raining season. Um, so here's just a couple of examples of just some of the amazing landscapes that you see in Namibia. Um, and, you know, the oldest desert in the world, the Namib Desert. Um, and also quite extraordinary different kind of trees. These are quiver trees on the right um, and many, many more amazing landscapes to, to see while in the country, as well as the dark skies. And here as well, you can see that the view that you get is very different than we do in the Northern Hemisphere. So in the Southern Hemisphere, you're kind of looking towards the center of the Milky Way galaxy. Um, and it's really quite very extraordinary and often and you can see other objects as well like the small and the large Magellanic clouds um, with your own eyes which is it's pretty amazing. So firstly I just wanted to highlight in terms of astrophysics Namibia has one of the the world leading telescopes 
for doing gamma ray astronomy. So that's very high energy astrophysics. Um, and this, these telescopes are called HET. There's five of them. They're really, really, really big. I think this big one in the middle is something like around 30 meters across. Um, so it's huge when you're standing next to it. Um, it's quite overwhelming. Um, they're located in the desert, not so far away from the capital, Vintuk, about a couple hours um, in what's called the Homas Highlands. And they have been in operation for about 20 years now. And it's a fairly large collaboration. So it's kind of um, was sort of led and constructed by the Max Planck Institute in Germany and is now a collaboration of 41 institutes across 15 different countries with hundreds of scientists, including um, scientists in Namibia as well. There's also some exciting future telescopes on the horizon, um, literally in this image. So here you have what's called the Gamsberg Plateau, um, which is probably an hour or so drive mostly because the roads are very um, quite adventurous to navigate. And I was very lucky enough to, to get in a vehicle in a, in a Land Rover and be driven up one of these very precarious roads um, where you know one small slip, slip and you're off the edge of the cliff kind of thing. Um, and there are actually some kind of smaller telescopes already on top of there. But um, essentially, they want to bring what's called the Africa Millimeter Telescope, which is already a telescope that exists in Chile in South America. Um, but it's not being it's not been used for very many years. It's a decommissioned telescope, but it still has a lot of potential and could definitely be used. And that's kind of on the other end of the spectrum. So these HESS telescopes are the for very high energy astrophysics, whereas if you're talking millimeters, that's kind of radio wave astronomy, which is the other end of the spectrum. Um, and this would be a huge collaboration joining up with other telescopes as well. So what's so exciting is I'm sure you've all seen this black hole, supermassive black hole image that the Event Horizon Telescope has uh, kind of created. And so that's thanks to a lot of radio observatories across the world and many different continents. But so far there isn't any radio dish at the right wavelength in Africa. So that would kind of put Africa on the map, but it would also really help um, improve the, the resolution of these images and, and get even better data and, and astronomy out of it. Um, and there's also another sort of project called the Square Kilometre Array, which will be mostly built in South Africa. But there's also plans to sort of bring other African countries into it as well. Um, and having kind of additional radio dishes in each of these countries. So potentially this new Africa Millimeter Telescope, which would be in Namibia, could both lend a hand in the Event Horizon Telescope as well as the SKA. So it's very exciting um, as long as everything kind of goes ahead. And the other thing that was really great to see is that they're currently developing this social impact plan, which I had um, a small part to play in. Um, essentially, they really want to make sure that the project is sustainable for Namibian people from the get go um, so that Namibians know about it, Namibians are involved, there's um, education going on at schools. So here is what's uh, here's one of the mobile planetariums where they're trying to essentially take it to every school in Namibia and sort of provide teachers and kids with resources to, to do astronomy. Um, and really also tying in with sort of the Namibian vision of sort of educating young people in science and technology, which astronomy does tie into. Um, and also the longer term vision of this sort of fourth industrial revolution, um, where so far in South Africa, they've been really successful through astronomy, bringing in a lot of um, 
young people training them up in in radio astronomy which has then led to them having a lot of skills in data science which so then they go on and get jobs in in data industry and things like that so it is a very valuable and and impactful way of building capacity um, in in African countries um, and also what's good to see as well is is some research being done so thinking about astronomy education currently in Namibia and what people kind of think about it or whether there should be more or how it's being um, taught and another uh, perhaps equally important aspect is thinking about the cultural heritage um, of the region where they want to actually build the AMT so on the Gamsberg mountain there's very much a historical um, um, association where you have uh, one of the main freedom fighters Hendrik Vitboy who perhaps was in the area or even on the mountain itself um, um, in this really important historical time in the past in, in, in Namibia and so it's just very important to consider where you you want to build these telescopes and that you're kind of making sure that these projects are kind of being celebrated and, and working together with the local people and the culture and that there is harmony. Um, and like perhaps some other astronomy projects which didn't work, which aren't working so well. Um, so as I mentioned already, there's a lot of opportunity for capacity building with, with astronomy, um, such as the training and the jobs um, and providing work, not just in astronomy, but people get then skills to go on and do other things. Um, and you can have all sorts of school visits to inspire the next generations of scientists and engineers. Um, and then also uh, tourism as well, and how it can be really great because Namibia is attracting all sorts of tourists, mostly for the safaris from all over the world. And they then have an opportunity to kind of learn more about what's going on in the universe and and also for the local people and and their relationship with their sky especially when a lot of the tourists are coming from places which would be very much light polluted um, and they perhaps wouldn't see a relationship like they would in Namibia um, and I mentioned briefly as well this the, the astronomy collaboration, um, especially kind of between the African countries and also the rest of the world. Um, and there's been kind of all sorts of pretty successful programs. So again, this is just highlighting in South Africa where they had um, this DARA project development in Africa with radio astronomy. And that was funded by something called the Newton Fund from the UK. I think they got about four million pounds to develop this and essentially over many years they've been training people in radio astronomy and providing them skills and then also in in other related skills as well and now many of these people are going on um, to either continue in research and academia or going into data industry um, and so thinking more about Namibia and the kind of sites that you have there so and, and what might appeal to people coming to Namibia in terms of astronomy related tourism. Um, so here is again, the, these giant HESS telescopes. Um, and this one would be the future Africa millimeter telescope, which is still in Chile and not yet in Namibia, but maybe in not too long, a few years time. And also what's cool is the, the Hoba meteorite. And so this is, the largest meteorite in the world is located in Namibia. And it's so heavy that no one has ever been able to move it. I think it weighs something like 10 elephants or something. It's, it's absolutely huge. Um, and then of course, the dark skies. And so there are a lot of um, things called, they call them astro farms, where essentially they're, they're places where people can, go to um, these resorts or lodges in the middle of nowhere in, in the desert 
and perhaps they have already some really nice telescopes that either um, people that know what they're doing and know how to observe and use the telescopes and do astrophotography, they come there and, and use them and pay to use them. Um, and, and mostly those people are all Germans, as far as I'm aware. Um, and then there's also the, the first ever dark sky, International Dark Sky Reserve, that was founded in, in Africa and also in all developing countries, I think, is this one in Namibia. So the, Nabin, the Namib Rand Nature Reserve. Um, and so that also attracts people to come there, even though pretty much anywhere in Namibia will have great skies. Um, but also it's nice to have specific places where people might get a bit more insight into sort of the astronomy and get help with stargazing and things like that. Um, there are disadvantages, however, to these um, programs so far in that there's not very many local people from Namibia who are um, who are black and who are hired or trained to, to do this. So mostly so far, it's sort of the white Namibians or it's um, volunteers coming from the US and they get paid, they get their sort of accommodation paid for when they to spend the winter in Namibia. Um, but essentially there is something missing here in that the, the sort of local black people are not being in, involved and included in in these astro tourism projects so we kind of wanted to change that a little bit so we got this funding um, which is why i was hired really to to carry out some astronomy training and develop this course for tour guides with a focus on namibia um, and the southern hemisphere really so you can actually see sort of the material that was developed for this course. It's all online, darkskytourism.com. Um, and we kind of structured it into five different parts, starting with sort of astronomy and thinking about um, the different planets in the solar system and, and what are the other galaxies that we see in the sky and kind of um, introductory material. Um, and then we, wanted to highlight as well the astrophysics that Namibia is doing because a lot of in fact basically all Namibians that I met didn't know anything about kind of astrophysics or that they had these HESS telescopes or things like that so that can um, be really nice to sort of highlight to them saying you have this in your country on your land um, and they were really excited and wanted, and of course they want to go and visit it and see it when they know about it. Um, then we also covered material on sort of how astronomy and astrotourism is being used for development, and that sort of includes examples from um, the Himalayas, where you might have heard of the Astro Stays project, where they're kind of training local women to do, uh, to be able to sort of carry out stargazing tours and, and accommodate tourists as well. Um, and so pro projects like that, that have been really successful. Um, and then of course, also the information on stargazing and some in indigenous stories about the stars as well. Um, and it's quite hard to kind of say specifically that these stories are Namibian or they're South African, because of course, all the different cultural groups um, kind of cross boundaries and that you can't really divide them by country as, as we try to do today. Um, and even if you consider Namibia, there are 11, 12, perhaps even more different cultural groups, which have, you know, they have completely different languages. Um, in fact, they communicate with each other in English because they can't communicate in any other language, really. Um, and they will all have their own unique individual stories. Um, so what's kind of important now as well is to, to highlight and celebrate that especially as this knowledge is also currently being lost, it's not really being passed down anymore. 
And then, of course, we wanted also to include why it's so important to be able to see the stars and, and the damages of light pollution and thinking about sustainability as well, especially because a lot of um, Namibian tourism is, is celebrated for being very sustainable. Um, so, but it hasn't often been thought about in terms of um, dark skies before. And so this is some of the, the sort of stories that we uncovered. So Megan Hughes was really, really helpful and, and really helped bring all of this together and, and uh, with, with creating and developing the course. Um, a lot of the stories do come from this book, Venus Rising. So if you're interested and want to learn more, um, I definitely recommend getting this book in particular. Um, where probably a lot of the stories I'm about to kind of highlight do come from. So what's also interesting or disappointing perhaps is that there has been sort of research being done on, on indigenous astronomy, but pretty much all of it is based in, is from indigenous stories in, in Europe, Australia and the Americas. And there's very, very, very little um, in Africa. And it's hard to know why. It could be simply because there are more astronomers elsewhere and not so many astronomers and astrophysicists in Africa. Um, and so actually, even though Africa accounts for around 17% of the world's population, there's only about 2% of them are professional astronomers. Um, and it is improving slowly, but um, we could be doing a lot better, that's for sure. Um, and so I just wanted to share some examples of the stories um, where, so again, because it's the Southern Hemisphere, you're seeing a lot of um, constellations that you wouldn't see in the Northern Hemisphere, like the Southern Cross. And so many of the different cultural groups, they will call um, or identify obviously animals and, and creatures that they are used to. So you often see things like these are the giraffes or these are the lions. And also again, a lot of um, stories kind of link to agriculture or, or things to do with, yeah, with crop cycles and when you should start planting or cultivating um, and so on. So, when you see particular stars in a certain part of the sky, then they know that it's the right time of year to, to begin um, cultivating for, just as one example. Um, there's also kind of very creative stories, like for example, um, the two lions um, pointing to the Southern Cross, they were once men, um, but a magical girl told, turned them into stars. Um, and there's many more stories. So here we've got Canopus, uh, known as the Horn Star. So um, traditionally, all the different, actually in several different cultures, they were very careful about watching for it and, and also wanting to kind of be the first to see it um, in the sky in the year. And, and then they would know it would be time to start breeding the sheep. Um, and that a new season was was coming um, and and even kind of rewarding prizes for for that as well. So for example, the first person to see it would climb a hill and blow an antelope horn and he would be rewarded with a cow. Um, here we have lots more animals. So we've got the ham. Um, group. I apologize in advance, I'm probably pronouncing many of the names wrong. Um, and so Orion's sword were either three female tortoises hanging on a stick, um, or the Huguansi um, were thought to be three zebras here in the belt. Um, or perhaps another culture, they or several other cultures, they saw them as being pigs. Um, being chased by three dogs. Um, and here as well, you kind of have the Pleiades coming into um, a, a relationship with Orion. Um, so for example, 
the Pleiades were called the Hunu, the Hunu Seti, um, and they were the daughters of the dawn or the sky god. And one day they told their husband to go out and hunt the zebras on the belt. But the husband took only one arrow with him and he missed. So the arrow, which uh, is the sword, still lies there today and he could never retrieve the arrow because of the lion that is Betelgeuse. Um, so it's definitely much too dangerous to try and get the arrow back. Um, there's also kind of thoughts and um, a quite, quite a strong relationship between people in Africa and comets. And often many groups kind of think of it as being a bad omen and, and quite a scary thing to see. Um, Apart from actually the, the San of Northern Namibia saw it as being a favorable omen and, and foretelling good rains, but for many other cultures, they were considered to be sort of evil spirits causing mischief um, associated with bad luck and war and death um, and quite depressing prophecies as it were. Um, and so now we come to the sun. Excuse me. Um, so the sun potentially, well, one cu culture it thinks of the sun as being, um, well, used to be a man who had a, a head that shone brightly. Um, but he would sleep in in the morning and he'd keep the light to himself and wouldn't um, share it with anyone else. So then the Bushman chopped off his head and put his head in the sky, which is now the sun. Um, then we also have other sun related stories. So this one's quite fun. The knee knee nothing people, so people without knees, um, live in the West and the sun is meat. Um, as the sun sets in the evening, the people with no knees, they catch it and they kill it and they eat it. And then they throw the shoulder blade back to the East where a new sun grows and rises in the morning. Um, and that's kind of similar also with this other group the sun is eaten every evening by a man and his wife and the shoulder braid is thrown and it grows again towards the west and then the moon um so there are sort of different stories related to kind of whether it's a new moon or a full moon um and I thought this in particular was quite interesting. So mothers would deworm their children at full moon, believing that at this time the worms collected in one place and could be effectively treated. And maybe I haven't actually looked into it, but there could well be some, some science behind that. Um, I wouldn't dismiss it. Um, and here's one other story. So the moon instructed the hare to deliver an important message as I die and return again, so shall man die and return again. However, the hare distorted the message and told man that he would die and never return. So it was a mistake, and that's what causes the moon to curse the hare and split his lip. And death since then has always existed on Earth. Um, and here we have this wonderful Milky Way which came to be because of a girl scooping up a handful of ashes from the fire, throwing it into the sky, making a glowing path um, so that people could see their journey home. Um, and as well, throwing also kind of bits of edible root and bringing into being the different colors of the sky, which you kind of see from more redder stars and, and whiter stars and, and things like that. Um, and so that's kind of a brief overview of, of some of the nice stories that I found, but there's much, much, much more um, to go into. And then here, I just wanted to highlight some of the work I've been doing with Cisco Aula, um, who is a tourism um, lecturer um, at one of the universities in Namibia, uh, international management, I think. And so we got some funding to go to Tsumkwe in the Nainyai Conservancy. So here, if this is the map of Namibia, 
um, you can see the region highlighted. So we're kind of quite far up. I think it was about a 10 hour drive one way. Um, and you're also quite close to, to Botswana there. And so because it is so remote, um, they do in some ways struggle to get tourists compared to other areas which are more well-traveled as it were. So we're kind of exploring um, indigenous stories about the stars and, and how potentially they might be interested in doing dark sky tourism, astro tourism um, in the region to kind of highlight it um, in a different way to, to bring people there. Um, and we ended up learning a lot about the fact that these stories are being lost. It's kind of mainly only one person that's alive left that knows some of the stories um, and that his father knew even more. And so everything kind of rests is resting with with this one person but so we we kind of recorded a lot of his stories um and what would be wonderful is um sharing it back with the community there and and sort of supporting them if they want to sort of use those stories and and bring them into tourism and and sort of find another way another means to make a living um it's also a region which is extremely um, poor and kind of they kind of survive on handouts and are very much neglected and and all sorts of difficult issues that they are struggling with alcoholism and, and things like that so they're really desperate for opportunities for work and um, for things to kind of really empower them in terms of their culture so um yeah it's really important to kind of learn more about at least for me it was very important to to learn more about the different groups in Namibia and and how they relate to not just astronomy but just thinking as well about the bigger picture and perhaps what is being learned there could also be useful for other indigenous communities perhaps from from this work um and so currently writing a paper um which hopefully will, will be published soon. Um, and that's the thing that we found as well is that in a lot of dark sky tourism, astro tourism work, indigenous stories are very much overlooked. They haven't been included very much at all. Um, and it seems like an obvious way to do tourism um, in terms of bringing those aspects in and also making it more accessible for local people as well, because um, a lot of the science can be really hard, especially, you know, I was talking to the tour guides and they really, you know, they didn't know that the earth goes around the sun and, and really kind of simple things that most people in the UK might grow up learning in school. They just don't have that education or access to knowledge in the same way that we do. And um, so that's also why, Kind of holding on to these indigenous stories can be great as well to then sort of um, navigate and branch into into other areas of science too. Um, so yeah, kind of overall, um, we're kind of interested in saying, you know, can can dark sky tourism margin um, empower these marginalized communities? Is it sustainable? Um, can it help to share and preserve cultural heritage? And also what are the benefits to tourists um, and, and what is the impact on a tourist for, for kind of experiencing astronomy, but also sharing those stories with local people. You can get this and, on YouTube, don't get it on YouTube. Um, and so there's also thinking about, again, the harmful effects of light pollution, um, and that's an opportunity again for tourists to perhaps learn something and then and then take it back home with them and perhaps they might be inspired to do something when they go back home. So yeah, I think that is kind of most of what I have um, for, to show you for now. Um, and yeah, I really just love these images. So these were created by a project which the Square Kilometre Array 
worked with um, both indigenous people in in South Africa and also in uh, Western Australia as well, where the where the SKA will also be built. Um, and they also they did all these amazing collaborative projects together and sharing and recording these stories as also through art. Um, yeah, so thank you, thank you very much. Well, oh, Hannah, that was lovely. Thank you so much. Um, and I, that was one of the questions I had is about the artwork. It's it's absolutely stunning. So, um, oh, thank you. I, I'm going to just have a quick look in the chat box because there's a couple of questions there. And what we can do if um, people would like is we can, um, I could stop the, um, the recording and if people are comfortable to ask questions, then um, then they can do so. So uh, first of all, I'm just going to have a quick look in the chat box. Um, because I saw a question about the name of the book and the author. Um, Karen Hunt has said, uh, where can I buy the book? And uh, a reminder of the author, Venus Rising. Um, Venus Rising by P.G. Alcock. Um, Alcock, is it A-L-C-O-C-K? Yes. P.G. So I'm guessing you can find it online. I do know that one of the websites somewhere does have it as a PDF online. I'll see if I can find the link. I have um, that and um, we can yeah. ask um, if there's any other questions. Um, it was absolutely lovely though, Hannah, there's lots of comments on, on that um, coming in. And I have to say it's very international tonight. So thank you everyone for joining us. We've, I'm just looking at my list we've got Chile we've got Texas we've got New York City we've got Germany um, we've got the UK so um, very international you see the audience you've attracted and we have <laughs> we have a very homesick Chris Oos, who is from Namibia and who says um, he's hoping to go to the dark sky side in two weeks time so you're making him homesick oh uh, so um, so with that, I'm going to stop the recording. Um, so thanks again, Hannah, and I'm going to go to questions and people might like to um, to ask. Yeah, they might like to ask the questions.